Thank you. Uh, whether Islam is compatible with human rights is, of course, a key question, especially given the massive human rights violations that we see in many countries today from Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. This is not a hypothetical debate. In practice, every hour of every day, we can see Islam is not compatible. We can see that Islam is antithetical to human rights. We can see that Islam is, in fact, a threat to human rights, particularly if it's Islam, and not just Islam, any religion, in power, in the state, in the law, in the educational system, in public policy. That is the end of human rights, LGBT rights, women's rights, free thought expression, and democratic politics. U.S. suffragette Elizabeth Stanton said, the Bible and the church are the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. And I could say the same, that the Quran, Islam, Islamism, fundamentalism, all fundamentalisms are the greatest stumbling blocks and threats, not just to women's emancipation, but human emancipation. This is firstly because Islamic rights are based in texts and sunnah from 1400 years ago. It's not relevant to 21st century humanity. It is full of misogyny. For example, one hadith of Muhammad, the sayings and actions of Islam's prophet, he says, I have left behind no fitna more harmful to men than women. That's from Al-Bukhari. And you see this also in the Judeo Christian tradition. There's a Jewish prayer recited by men, of course, that says, thank you, Lord, who has not created me a woman. The problem, in my opinion, starts at the source, in the scripture, in the text. I want to quote Stanton again. Every form of religion which has breathed upon this earth has degraded women, not just Islam. Look at the Hindu right in Modi's India, the Jewish right in the Palestinian territories, the Buddhist right in Sri Lanka and Myanmar, and of course the Christian right that we see on the rise in Europe, North America, and, and other places. I know there are Islamic feminists like Amina Wadud, who say that the problem isn't Islam, but it's the patriarchal interpretations. However, in my opinion, you can't make an ideology that is fundamentally misogynist pro-women's rights. An example is Surah 4, verse 34, which says men are the rulers of women. I mean, what do then Islamic feminists will say, it doesn't really mean that men are rulers, it means that they're there to guide women, that they're there to protect women. And we do hear arguments that say that it's not discrimination based on sex, but it's because of economics. Because <coughs> men, for example, are the breadwinners, or in the verse that says uh, women can be beaten as a last resort if they're disobedient, it says, well, they can be beaten in a way that doesn't leave any marks on the body. And of course, these discussions are considered to be nuanced. And to say that this just isn't good enough is to be simplistic. But frankly, I think these arguments are more a defense of Islam than they are of women's rights or human rights. When it comes to interpretation, let's not forget that the Islamic feminist interpretation, which is lacking, is only one of many. And you cannot leave rights to the mercy of, let's face it, religious men who want to maintain their privilege. Islamic feminists say what they want. They can say whatever they want, but it is those in power that decide the authentic interpretation. And that's Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic regime of Iran, ISIS, Saudi Arabian regime. Secondly, Islamic human rights is based on serving God. Allah is at its center, which is why it fails so abysmally, based on a cruel, misogynist, merciless God with fragile sensibilities that demands submission and tolerates no dissent. Whereas universal human rights, it's the human being who's at the center. Thirdly, you cannot criticize Islam. You cannot change its fundamentals. You cannot reform it because it is seen to be divine, perfect, timeless. Take the Hudud laws, stoning for sex outside of marriage, execution for apostasy, amputations for theft. These are fixed, mandated punishments. 
Of course, I know there are Islamic reformers like Abdullah and Naim. But if they live in Islamic states, they are either dead or in prison. On the other hand, human rights law can be changed. It can be developed. It can be reformed. It can be improved. It's not perfect, of course. But that is its strength, not its weakness. It is made by human beings for human beings. Another point is that in Islam, rights are based on your status, not on your person. Take personal status law, for example. Child custody uh, goes to the father in a divorce at a preset age, even if the father is an abuser. It is about religious law being paramount and not child welfare. And there are many such examples. Sorry, can I pass the water, please? Human rights norms. Uh, rights are for the individual, whatever they, their status. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thanks. Also, if you look at Islamic human rights, it's conferred on the collective in group and only for those who behave, who submit. This is ignorant of the diversity that belongs to that so-called group, which is why it quickly becomes coercive and totalitarian, absolutist. There's a stark difference with this from human rights. Look, if you don't like abortions, if you don't like apostasy, if you don't like gay marriage, if you don't like blasphemy, don't do it. But recognize the right of other individuals to do so. You cannot use cultural particularism to deny other people's rights. The right to own sex slaves, the right to impose the burqa, which is a mobile body bag on women, the right to legally kill apostates in an ideal Islamic state. These are not rights. They are the denial and suppression of rights. It needs to be said, if your culture violates rights, it must be changed, it must be condemned, it must be abolished. You cannot legitimize violence and rights violations by saying it's your culture. And it's certainly not everyone's culture who is Muslim or presumed Muslim. This disregards the empirical evidence of diversity. Culture is not homogenous. It is not static. It is not singular. There is dissent. There is contestation. There is resistance. For example, the veil is something that the Islamic regime of Iran has often said is, is women's culture in Iran. If it was the case, then it would not need to have such a widespread and vast machinery of suppression to arrest, to fine, to beat, to threaten women who are unveiled. And as you all know, Mahsa Jina Amini was killed in September last year for so-called improper veiling. And it was the start of the woman life freedom revolution in Iran. The Syrian Marxist Sadiq al-Az says, Western Orientalism is mirrored by this Orientalism in reverse of the fundamentalists, which manifests itself in the construction of Islamic human rights like we see in Iran and Saudi Arabia. It makes it no less reactionary, ahistorical ahistor and anti-human. Finally, I do need to make this point as it often comes up. For sure, Western governments use human rights language to violate rights, just as the Islamists do. Many Western governments also violate human rights. Two examples will suffice. There are rights of civilians in, the war, in war. The US is the only country that has used nuclear bombs and the right to refugees and asylum seekers. That is a basic human right enshrined in international uh, human rights law. And yet we see so many countless people dying on our shores and it's still not enough for the Tories who want to send them back to Rwanda. Human rights has never been granted by governments. They have been fought for. People have died for them. They have been killed for them. The, uh, human rights has been secured by vast class, social, political, civil rights movements that has organized primarily against states, but also organized religion. It has never been granted by any state or by any god. Universal human rights represents the best of humanity's struggle for tolerance, for the respect of human beings, and for their rights and freedoms. Islam and religion represent some of the worst. Thank you.